Hi, welcome back. I am with the Buddy Carter. So Buddy Carter was a trader at Goldman Sachs. He probably runs a big, big PA in relative terms, PA being personal account. Uh, that's what he's decided to do with all of his monies, going back as far as I can remember knowing Buddy. Um, so what that means is he actually really cares about his own money and how that moves and what the risk components are. I think he's thought about this uh, in a lot of ways maybe that uh, will hopefully relate to what you're going through there at home. There's a lot of misinformation in the marketplace, as Jim Rickards pointed out. There's too much information, frankly, uh, that really isn't all that useful. But um, Buddy spends a lot of his time, and I'm highly appreciative of, uh, of it, uh, trying to contextualize what it is that's going on. So thanks for, um, thanks for spending some time with me again today. Thanks for having me. Yeah, so the, uh, the main question that you wake up every day trying to ask yourself, <coughs> what is the truth? And I think that's a pretty good start, don't you? What is the truth and what am I going to do about it? Yeah. Um, and that's the challenge we live. Uh, I was having a conversation with yes, somebody yesterday and, and he said maybe we're just getting old. Maybe the distance from some of the, the most important topics, we're just, we're just not thinking about things correctly. I said, well, um, I don't know. There are some things that are happening today, uh, certainly with the activist position of central banks and the participation in the markets that we've never seen before. Right. So, you know, I wake up and, and try to take care of myself first in terms of, you know, our own, um, you know, financial activities, and I try to be as equipped as possible. Now, when you think about this and, and you spend a lot of time, I'd say, analyzing best practices, you've been, and hopefully uh, on the back end there, you guys can show some of these quotes where um, Buddy cites Ray Dalio, Peter Thiel, Claude Shannon. Uh, these, are, these in particular are great quotes. These are thought leaders in many regards, very different people. Um, can you talk about how you've thought about analyzing excellence and best practices in risk management? Um, sure, well, um, yeah, I, I guess the impetus for me was significant financial injury where I knew I had to do some things differently. Um, I think when I was here last time I talked about, um, I was fortunate to spend the first 17 years of my career in a pretty privileged position on Wall Street, where I always had uh, uh, very close uh, proximity to visual clues about the market. We talked about the information ecosystem. We talked about how to understand the way the world was unfolding. You know, here uh, Jim Rickards is talking about Bayes' theorem and, and understanding what happened in the past and how is today going to be different. Well, as I said to Jim before he went on, I know that I was always able to understand the highly likely thing in the market that wasn't going to happen. Right. So if you were able to decide what's not going to happen directionally with respect to volatility or you know, over time, boy, you know, and that's what, that's what the imitation game was about, was mm -hmm. narrowing the, the possibility. Mm -hmm. And like Jim, I would encourage everybody to go see that, that movie because it's a wonderful exploration of the challenge of large outcomes. Does, yeah. it, does it surprise you that the imitation game, Alan Turing, Claude Shannon, which you have this quote, Claude Shannon sure. quote, sure. does it surprise you that we're just getting there now as an American society where people know who they are, even know who they are? I mean, never mind know how to apply what they know. Sure. Um, well, uh, there's a wonderful uh, YouTube video on Claude Shannon called the, um, uh, the Father of Information Theory or, or, or something like that. And I think it's 29 minutes long. And it's, it's, it's a wonderful story about how Claude Shannon from Michigan was a mathematician and electrical engineer. Um, and he is widely considered to be the father of information theory. Mm -hmm. um, and I watched that video and I thought, wow, it's all about understanding the fidelity of the signal, the, the, the capacity of the pipe to, to carry the signal, um, and, the, and what you do with the signal when you get it. Yeah. So they were obviously all considered, um, uh, uh, they all worked for Bell Labs, and, and it was all about telephony at the time. Mm -hmm. But Jim Simons of Renaissance, um, and a lot of the Erwin Jacobs of Qualcomm, they were all students of yeah. Claude Shannon. I mean, signal within the noise. I mean, it's not, by the way, it starts with Bayesian inference. And sure. when I say signal in the noise, people are going to think, oh, what's that New York Times guy? Uh, that predicted the elections. Well, he, he used the same Bayesian right. inference process that sure. Claude Shannon used. And lo and behold, he comes out of nowhere and becomes the best political forecaster that, that we've, uh, I guess, allegedly ever seen. But again, the question is how, how, how early? Are we too early? Are we too old but too early on, in understanding wow. this? Well, you know, it's an interesting, um, I think that, uh, I think people are starting out, starting to find out 
certainly over the last 10 years, the truth is not always delivered at the time that it's appropriate to do something with it. Right. Um, and, and our job is, first and foremost, to stay away from financial injury in the market, is, is to make sure that, that you live to fight another day. Mm -hmm. um, so definitionally, you almost have to, a friend of mine used to say, hit them where they ain't. Um, you know, put yourself in a position where you're willing to, I remember in the uh, August and September of 13, as money was flowing out of fixed income, I had no idea when I bought the TLT, the MUB, utilities over the course of a six week period. I just knew that there was a percentage of my assets that needed higher coupon exposure. Yep. There's capital gain, uh, capital gain coupon and volatility. That's it. Um, and, and know the game that you're playing. If you have to live off it, you need to know those factors. And, and, and know who you're playing against. Right. Um, and I think it's unbelievably complicated now that you've got central bank sovereign wealth funds actively investing in the markets and they are classified as non-economic actors. Well, I mean, and, and they have uh, a non-Bayesian inference process that they would say uh, is a complete guess. Here's, here's another quote that you have. This is yours. Sure. Uh, the data-dependent quote from Fisher. Sure. When you first saw this, what did you do? I was horrified. <laughs> I mean, seriously, this is a ridiculous quote. Is it just that he's old enough? Uh, or actually, this is, at this point, does he care to just call it what it is? I don't know. I put that, you know, I spent two years on Twitter. For me, it was an experiment to see the way the uh, <laughs> content and uh, frequency, velocity, configuration, all the different aspects of Signal, how that was being changed by an open community um, of, of gatherers and uh, people that wanted it. I couldn't believe it when I read that. Yeah, but it, it's the truth. That's the point. How much longer, I mean, and then you have another Fisher who's come along and said, uh, former head of the Bank of Israel, who is now Stanley the Fisher, sure. second in command to Janet Yellen, sure. who's in, in basically different words said the same thing. So how long do you think that the truth becomes in America that really we shouldn't trust the Fed because they're just guessing? Well, I don't know. Um, you know, from what I understand, you know, Stanley Fisher was at MIT, um, yeah. and n you, you can bet that he knew Claude Shannon and, and all of these people. They were all in the same yeah, same, uh, same uh, education pool, um, and they have two interests: a signaling mechanism yep. and a transmission mechanism. You know, we know that the transmission mechanism, transmission mechanism is now more deliberate than we would have thought when you've got people like the SNB, as of the end of June of last year, own $27 billion in U.S. equities, including ExxonMobil, which was their third largest holding. So it'll be interesting to see how that non-economic actor, you know, you know anticipates or, or, or deals with that exposure over time. Um, so I don't know. I think we live in a really interesting world now where you have to understand very clearly what your needs are and what are the different aspects of information intake and, and analysis that are most aptly suited for you to perform, which at its very essence is survival. Mm -hmm. Now a lot of people have said, and you can see this again on Twitter all day long, you've observed it, I kind of, um, I, I guess editorialize on it sometimes. Y you call them passive trend followers on Twitter. In my speak, that's people that use a f what I affectionately call 50-day moving monkey, and they consider sure. that their signal. If you're above the 50-day, it's bullish. If you're below it, it's bearish. And there's no back test to suggest that it has any relevance. But here we are. Many, many people in the market dialogue talk about the 50-day moving average, whereas you talk about the expected range. Right. I talk about the risk range. Right. So can you go through that just sure. at a bare minimum so people don't think that I'm crazy? Sure. I was just you know, uh, speaking to Darius Dale, who I think unbelievably highly of. I think he's a wonderful young analyst. And he's got a great future. Um, and we were talking about the different applications that I've created for my own use. All of them were built to prevent me from injury. Because I always found... Losing money. Yeah, yeah. right. <laughs> I always found it was hard to match caution with higher prices and courage with lower prices. Yep. So how do I put myself in a position to be able to deal with that? So one of the things, I, as I started reading about you know, um, you know, different information scientists, um, putting myself in a position with the right information at the right time. Well, I had to be more specifically attuned to something like the range. Now, I never in my professional life ever thought about a volatility generated risk range because I had all the information clues and all the benefit of proximity yeah. to help me understand how probability was evolving through time and I always seemed to win. Because you were at Goldman and at that point you were the eyes and ears of the market. You could see all the flow. You could right. make your own 
Right. Um, you can make your own adjustments, but now you are by yourself and you have to create your In own. a dark room. Yes. Right, and if I don't have, um, see the smart money meeting in my house happens at six o'clock in the morning, <laughs> not at four o'clock. Yeah. You know, um, so I don't need to describe to Mrs. Carter how I got the risk range wrong. She doesn't, yeah. she's not interested. Um, so I came up with, with this volatility range as a way to allow me to have very specific understanding of what the potential floor for the daily market could be and what the potential ceiling could be. Yep. Now I understand that there is variation over time, but for me what I found was that much more specific numerical understanding of the possibility, yep. one, led to a much clearer understanding on my uh, behalf of where I could locate transactions. You know, again, I spent two years on Twitter writing about this. 99.9% um, of, of the people were highly appreciative. Because you um, gave them the range. I gave them the, well, uh, yeah. you know, again, I gave them what my version of the range was. Um, and I posted it because I wanted to see what people thought about it. But why, why have we not, I mean, first of all, I do it. I call it the risk range, you call it the expected range, team put the slide up just to show uh, what Buddy calls that. But the buy side does it, every quant uh, sure. oriented risk manager that I know does it, but the entire dialogue on Twitter has to do with these simple point and click, one factor model, moving monkey averages. Right, but again, the, the narrative, meaning the content of the narrative changes when better solutions become available. Exactly. So I remember very clearly on Twitter saying that the, Twitter was just the start of an online more, oh gosh, I don't, I'm going to choose my words carefully. Um, the evolution of real-time communication in terms of content format velocity will continue to change as people find out certain things work better. Right. And there's nothing to, um, uh, to accelerate that evolution of opinion from resistance to, uh, texture and abrasion, mm. meaning losing money. Yeah. So what I found, you know, just in my own world, if I knew that I could locate transactions closer to the floor or sales closer to the ceiling, it was advantageous for me. I never even thought of it before. No, I mean, it's... Uh, it's, it's, it's it's so straightforward. The next couple charts, you show the average versus the expected, a histogram of the expected range versus the actual range. Again, can you, can you talk about sure. that relative yeah. to maybe mistakes you used to make? I mean, I, did you ever use a moving average? Uh, to, did not, you ever not, buy high? Not, not mechanically. High? No, no, I, I bought high plenty of times, but it wasn't because of a moving average. Right. You know, um, you know, I said to a young person recently, you know, my idea of probabilistic evaluation for a long period of time was a feeling, not a number. <laughs> That's good. That's really good. Um, and the problem was, is that I had been successful. So boy, was I misinformed. Yeah. Um, and it's not until I figured out, oh my god, in a dark room, you're going to have to really be able to articulate numerical outcomes more fluidly. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, it's, it, it, it's something that fluid is a, a fair word to use. How much? How, how fluid or dynamic do you think you are today versus where you were three years ago, five years ago, or when you would say that you had that moment? I remember you came to my office in probably 2008 or 2009. It was uh, March of 2009. 2009, uh, yeah. and, and you, you tacked it up all over the place. Sure. We were on the whiteboard. Storyboards, yeah. yeah. So you knew it, but, but what is the difference today versus that moment maybe, or the moment where the lights went off? Okay, so um, I'm in the process of trying to migrate from Excel specific to R, okay, um, which is which is a which is a big change for me, um, and what it allows me to do is take a lot of the uh, the dexterity that I've learned over the last couple of years. Um, again, writing for two years on Twitter about important risk. Now there are some people that could dispute whether what I did was important or not. I learned an awful lot by putting yourself by putting to by ex right? by exposing myself um, in a narrative way about things that are so critical to get right. Yeah. Um, and what I tried to do was it was a, I mean it, I was really trying to think out loud, um, and I I really used to get very thoughtful questions from from students from registered investment advisors from other people, and they know very quickly based on the, the, the tenor and tone of your answer, mm -hmm. um, what substance there is. Yeah. Um, now, I'm sure there were some people that, that, that 
you know, had a, a dim view of what I was trying to do, but it was for me. Yeah. Uh, I wasn't selling anything. Um, I, was, I was very attentive in terms of uh, trying to offer something that I thought had value, yeah. was timely, was professional, I was courteous. You accused me once of being too nice. Um, <laughs> I'm too mean. Yeah, well, um, but that can change. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, it's interesting. I mean, if you look at all the tools, that's one thing that I struggle with sometimes. I mean, internally, we're, we're trying to migrate from Excel to Python. Sure. So when you're modeling, right. you know, Python is more robust. There's, you yeah. know, it's easier to share the network. There's a lot of different reasons to use Python instead of Excel. But we have so many different reasons to stay with the tools that we have. Like, how much do you struggle with that? Immediately, I can tell you that I feel like I see the, be the data better in Excel. Yeah. I see it better. That's because um, this is all we've ever looked at. I understand. But as I improve my R skills and my R understanding and my R interests and wants and wishes, the power of being able to create functionality yeah. in packages Much. to run across any security you want to produce both the numerical output and the graphical output, yeah. um, that's the big uh, transition. Mm. I mean, it's not really what it looks like per se, it's how well it works. <laughs> well, you know, again, one of the reasons why I wanted to write in real time on Twitter is because I wanted to see if there was any benefit to be able to generate um, narrative content in, in real time. So match a statement with a time that was analyzable in retrospect. Right. That's why the risk, you know, the risk meeting happens in the morning, not after the fact. Yeah. Um, and you know, I'm a big believer um, that, that a lot of the standard market color um, will be numerically generated and automatically delivered. Um, I'm very interested in the market for glanceable moments, for, for pieces of risk information at specific periods of time delivered in a, in a way where the, the, the portfolio manager or investor is interested in getting them. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the challenges is I spent time at Bloomberg with their social media uh, business and their news department. And we were talking about, you know, the evolution of the way real time fits into research, fits into news, fits into the cosmos of, you know, this deluge of, of data. Yep. And the first question they asked me is, how do we believe anything on Twitter is true? I said, you can't. I said, you can't, unless you've got a verifiable contact with the person that is writing it. Right. I said, but what the market is going forward is to create not the analytical device to see into the haystack as it grows, but to write better needles. No, oh, right. To, to, to actually write content that is short form, that is descriptive, that's numerically generated, yes. and it fits into the, the change in the probability of inference over time. The problem is that you're starting with such a low base in terms of how but that's what it is. educated people are. I understand. So if you're at a certain level, you, want to, you just want to say, read the putt. You know, tell, me where, you know, tell me what the coordinates are on this putt. Somebody who just started golfing wants right. to look at the putter. They will look around. They need somebody to talk to them. There's a whole communication process around this that I feel um, it's, I feel it's going to take a long time. I really do, because the narrative outside of us is so large and loud and... It'll change with the bear market. No, 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 no. You so, think so? No, no, no. Okay. So the, that's, that's, that's a great point. So when I, when I wrote to you in October and we were talking about media, I had written that note in February of last year that, that traditional financial media is turning secretariat into a mule. <laughs> um, and, and, and there's a whole story on that. But in, in, in the, down, the downside deviation of, of October, I wrote a note to you that said, how in the world can traditional financial news be about politics, comedy, or titillation? <laughs> it, it, th th they're not inputs in any of my, but, but when, you re when you watch the traditional financial news, those weighted values have completely overwhelmed, in, in my view, and, and this is in, in, a, in a business that says, we don't want to hold our guests to account because we don't want to offend them. Right. The, you know, uh, again, it's just, it's just a different way of looking at the world. Yeah. Um, and when stuff goes up for five years straight, there's a lot of people that, that mistake the wind at their back for some a 300-yard drive. Yeah, some type of knowledge or level of repeatable competence. I mean, literally all that, uh, which I want to go through next, is how sure. you think of your storm tracker, like volatility. Right. I mean, volatility changes this fast. And volatility is something that people that use simple moving averages don't look at volume, yeah. don't look at accelerations, decelerations. They have no toolbox to look at. Therefore, they become very much 
uh, I'd say almost mystified, buddy, when we have big moves like we've seen most recently. So could you explain that? A team will throw up what, what, what you talk about mm -hmm. in terms of the leading edge of realized volatility. Sure. Uh, I went to California um, last May. I had been on Hedgeye TV at the end of April, I believed. I be believe. Yeah. And I went out to the Milken Conference. And at that point, there was a large solar flare. And I remember when I was in my hotel, I was watching TV one night, and it, it showed the, the NASA video of the flare being expelled from the sun. And I don't know why I thought about it, but it's so irregular, and it's so violent, and it, it happens so quickly. Yeah. I thought, oh my goodness, it's almost like the expansion of realized vol in the market. If you're too close, you're going to know it quick. Right. So one of the things I wanted to do was create some kind of visual in my toolkit of the expansion of realized vol. Now, I, almost every portfolio manager investor, you could have a long series of conversations about the what, you know, this notion of map reduction. What is the right reduction of large set of values to give you an indication of price change? Yeah. So that's a really challenging issue. And so what I figured is I'm going to look at a range of, I'm going to use 60 days as a base value. Now you and I know that 60 days doesn't change nearly quickly enough mm. to alert you when things are going to deviate in an accelerating fashion. They just don't. Um, so what I did is I took 3, 5, 10, and 30, exponential and simple, so there's a total of 10 moving averages. And then I combined them all together into what I call the flare, which is the main part of Storm Tracker. And then I used the EMA part of the, the large uh, universe of values as the leading edge because the ex exponential moving average moves, moves much faster. Yeah. Here's what I know, is when the leading edge is accelerating away, it's critical to know when it stops, yep. which it did on October 15th. It did, you don't know the true deviation. That's why you've got to have it across time uh, yep. frames. But for me, in my little world, after the risk meeting, you know, I don't get you know, to do positions over. I've got, to, I've got to be buckled in for the duration. So that, to me, is an absolutely important thing to look at across any market. Mm -hmm. And I found out it works. It's, it couldn't be simpler, and it works for me very well. Well, using an exponential function alone sure. you know, changes the scenario analysis dramatically. A lot of people use simple moving average. Oh, I understand. I mean, I so uh, I, I don't get that because it, it, it adheres to nothing from a nonlinear calculation perspective. There's really no reason to use uh, something like that in the storm. But, but if we're in a volatility storm. So I, I immediately went agnostic and said, you know what, I'm going to look at all of them. You just I, throw them all in there. I so throw them all in there, and I've got the proxy weight of the, of the yeah. flare. But what I really know is that when EMA stops going up in, in one of the top pages I sent you was the beauty of and or not. Yeah. Claude Shannon's master's thesis in 1937 at MIT was on the beauty of and or not. If it's good enough for him, I can somehow fit it into my. Yeah, you'll uh, take it. Uh, you know. Yeah, I think that that's 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 it. Actually, you show the S and P 500 using the storm tracker here, from 1995 to current. So, what does this tell us relative to where we've been? This, so, this looks like a balloon to me, man. Well, what what that shows is uh, a log chart of the S and P 500, mm -hmm. and the 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 EMA storm tracker over time. Mm. You know, one of the challenges is knowing when something structural is going on is the first part of the change in the structural nature of the market is high velocity and you don't know whether it's just another short term high velocity downside deviation or it's something more lasting. So the interesting thing is when you go back and look at 2000, you look at 2007, um, those deviations were the first buoy system that allowed you to understand if it doesn't stop going up, you've got an additional problem. Mm -hmm. So there's another slide in there that shows the uh, actual versus expected range. The sequence is unbelievably important. When you have a continuation of the sequence, when tomorrow's expected range is greater than today's expected yep. range, be prepared before the start of anything you know, for additional volatility. Yeah, that's, that's been. That would, I would, um, all my work would say that. I, I always say to my teammates, a widening range is a clean cut signal. When people say, well, why, why do you sound so amped up this morning? I'm not amped up. The market just told me to be amped right. up. The widening range is a leading indicator for volatility. Clean cut, period. It's not even debatable at this point. So I wonder, when you look at 
the so, narratives out there. Is there anything like Elliott wave theory or any no, of these the mark never, systems was, that no, people use? That, I was never, that, you know. Um, they don't have volatility components. Well, I, I don't know what they have. I, I, I know what I have. And again, it's all about my hand on my steering wheel with my money not to run into the, the, the wall. And you, know, the, you, know, you were talking with Jim Rickards about the behavioral aspect of the investment process. I know in my own life that my behavior changes when the velocity of my NAV <laughs> accelerates on the downside. Yeah. So I always try to act in a preventive way. It's like when I sent you and Darius and, and Jeremy the, uh, you know, the video of the glacial calving in September. Yeah, fantastic video. That was a metaphor for instantaneous. Yep. You know, and, and the line was, we heard some strange noises and then all hell broke loose. Now, when you go back and look at August, on any kind of a time frame, it was this period of extraordinarily low global market volatility. Now, the beauty of and or not says, you know, from, you know, returns, it, the way I look at returns had never been higher per unit of volatility. So my chance is to run away when the sun is out, hopefully not early enough where I leave too much money on the table, to prepare myself for the acceleration of downside at the very least to be carefully considering is now the right time. Now who do you think explains that either uh, in a book or anywhere else for that matter? Uh, Seth Klarman calls it the margin of safety. Who do you think explains selling when the sun is shining appropriately? Well, I, you know, I, again, it, it's really, it's, it's different for every person. Um, you know, I always heard that you have to have an investment process that suits your personality. I'm perennially fearful. Um, <laughs> So, you know, I was a saver accumulator. I was a good kid. You know, I wasn't allowed, you know, there, I mean, there are certain things that I've yeah. had a long history of doing. Um, and I feel very comfortable. I'm not a counter trend person. I'm not that at all. Yeah. I'm, a, I'm a buy higher, sell higher, -er. you know, <laughs> I, um, you know, with my ability to, and so what, the reason that, that the analyst, the more specific analysis of realized volatility has m been meaningful to me is it's allowed the, um, you know, my hand, the, the dexterity of my hand, the, you know, to feel the market in a completely different way. Mm -hmm. Here's why it's important. Because when you talk to any large um, fund management business, an enormous percentage of their transaction activity happens in the last 30 minutes of the day. Right. Now, every single investor that's watching this call knows the most frustrating thing about the current structure of the market is that it can open up 85 basis points and then stay in a 12 basis point range for six hours and then do something typically it's consistent with the move in the morning mm -hmm. but you and I don't have the same insight on what the move might be but the systems do mm -hmm. it's like the last time I was here we were talking about front running the systems I know nothing at least I know that mm -hmm. you know at least I'm honest with myself and I'm just trying to be you know effective and and when those when those transaction volumes um, which, are, which are basically human delivered, meaning it's a portfolio manager that selects an algorithm and it selects a time during the day whether to, to execute it. Yeah. Um, they're human too. Mm -hmm. They typically don't sell when, you know, how many PMs actually sold Apple computer today? No, I'm just asking a question. Yeah, probably not a lot. I, I don't know. No, yeah, I mean, you're, you're, they're in the business of saying, I nailed it. So again, it's relative performance, it's absolute performance. In the mutual fund community, if you're long Apple today, you have to tell everyone that you're long Apple. You can't ha have sold right. it, you know, just in case it keeps going higher. If it keeps going higher, you know, you can't have sold it. I mean, this is there's right. a, an entire, almost like a justification matrix that goes on the other side institutionally of what an individual would probably not make those same decisions with their own money. But why is that any different than what Jim Rickard said about the central banking? You know, if you're right by yourself, it's really a detriment. Yeah. Because that you know the, the the distribution of opportunity for you is 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 right. fraught with, right. you know. And I know in my own life, you know, if I smell fire, if, if I smell smoke in the theater, I'm you know out the door. Yeah, exactly. You know. But I mean, in in uh, in active management speak, I mean, Jim Rickard's kind of framework of describing why people act in herds and are happy to be maybe not happy to be, but okay being wrong together is that 80% of people can't beat the market anyway. So, you yeah. know, they're all sitting there kind of hoping that fees never go down uh, and that, the, you know, the clock never comes up on them. You know, so uh, I personally like that because it provides us opportunity. It provides us big opportunities, in fact, where people are chasing performance. There's a lot to do. Well, I, I you know, again, for me, it, it, my objective is total return over time. 
Right. That means the amount of pebbles I collect over a span of time. Um, lower pebbles, not good. More pebbles, okay, but it never stops. Don't lose pails of pebbles. Don't lose pails of pebbles. <laughs> so, so over time, the, the thing that I concentrate most on is being an able decision maker. Right. To be balanced, to be able to look at a world where I know I know nothing, um, and I'm I'm not you know trying to impress anybody other than myself to be able to perform you know when the storm starts. Yeah. I think your advice here is right on. By the way, we're going to take some questions now. I've got a lot of questions in here for Buddy already. Uh, one's real simple. I mean, it's what advice would you give to a guy like me managing his own money? Some people have just started doing this. Yeah. Um, keep a record of everything. Um, yeah. Meaning, meaning notebooks. Uh, well, notebooks um, and and transactions. Um, I asked a, a a friend of mine who runs a fairly large fund a very simple question. Do you, when you, when you look at the attribution of your transaction stream, how specific is it? He said, well, you know, we've done very well over the last 20 years. <laughs> no, no, I, so, so the challenge for me is what I found is when I started taking a red marker and actually locating it in, an, in a range and a green marker, when I first started doing it, red was low and green was high. So that's why in my range documents, I always have red high and green low. Right. To get my mind, it's the first time you and I met. Yeah. I was, I was enthralled by your use of color. So the first thing I would say is put everything in Excel, write down everything, um, and you'll learn over time. Yeah, for sure. That's a great, that is great advice. Because the only way to really identify and uh, learn from your mistakes is, is to literally analyze it. I mean, you have to. And yeah, it was Eric Consider of Nanix says the data doesn't lie. Yeah, exactly. Uh, you can lie to yourself all day long, but your wife might be happy at 4 o'clock or your husband, whoever you are, waiting for the 4 o'clock meeting. Right. Uh, I think that's a great... And we don't have one of those in our house. <laughs> <laughs> um, options. You know, weekly options, do you use them? How do, how do you use options in the game that you play? It's actually a really good question. Um, typically, any option activity would be... Um, you know, one to three month calls against long term holdings. Okay. Um, so I, I'm, I'm, I'm selling calls. Selling calls after an appreciation. Um, so that was something that that I feel very comfortable with. It's it's really an interesting issue because it, it foots directly to your your analysis of realized volatility. Yep. Um, and here's an example. If you look at the front month of crude oil, from January first through to January 1st of last year through today. Mm -hmm. And you take January 1st of last year through the end of um, September, and you look at 10-day realized vol and you annualize that, it averages out at 15%. But it was annualizing at 10% before it went to 15%. Right. And if you take 10-day realized vol annualized to now, it's now at 38%, mm. with a high of 65%. Now, what I would tell you the most important piece of information was the fact that it peaked in, in the middle of December at 65%. Is that where it peaked? Yes. Really? And what you're seeing now is, is a dramatic uh, departure. in So realized volatility is dropping at an accelerating rate in oil. Mm -hmm. As you know, that the, the, the price of oil hasn't moved now in a number of weeks. So whoever was responsible for the controlled demolition, it was a very, very different because volatility and price haven't been attached since the middle of December, which is really odd. Well, it's, I mean, my model would always say that once your point, I like to use the waterfall. Sure. So again, the point of entropy was that 65% um, level, and then bang, you're down now at the bottom or the base of the waterfall, and you're trying to figure out what to do. So the range actually starts to narrow, and volatility starts to fall off. Doesn't mean the prices go up. No, I understand that. No, no, no. I mean, it just that's what happens almost every single time. But but the but the the, the difference in realized volatility does send a signal to all the positions that are either not long or short right. to be more interested in the fact that greater acceleration will you know w that's a warming notion to them. Yeah. What I think is most interesting about the fall in oil is other than your note at seventy five dollars that it said expects dramatically lower prices. I don't know anybody at 100 that said it was going to 75, but now I know a lot of people that at 45 are saying it's going to lower than, lower than yeah, 45. Experts, experts. No, I don't. I, I don't. They appear everywhere. Um, actually, you're getting some great comments on here. Keep 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 it on, buddy. Keep killing it, my man. Brilliant, speechless. Thank you. Um, some great comments. He is very good at what he does. Uh, question: How do you know this is? How do you know when it's time to get out? <laughs> 
The average investor has missed a lot of this bull market due to the overt bearishness of sediment. But again, how do you know when it's time to get up? OK. Um, my first lesson was in, I think, 1993, when Philip Morris cut the price of Marlboro. And the price of Philip Morris stock, which was the best performing stock in the 1980s, went down 25%. And I found out that the Deflation. analyst I found out the analyst was able to take the stock off the recommended list at the day before its price. Oh, geez. And I thought, fool me once, you know, and I thought, you know, God. So I, when I said that I always err on the side of caution, for me, the most important aspect is being able to make good decisions over a long period of time. Yeah. Now, I know that I'm not going to be perceptive enough, courageous enough, um, foolhardy enough to participate in all the upside. Um, you know, I do it enough where I benefit. So, so when the downside deviations happen, I am able to start to think about across time frames recommitment. Mm -hmm. Now, as I think the last time I was here, I talked about the different types of accounts I have, taxable accounts, non-taxable accounts, different types of more liquid investment. Yeah. But it gives me a, uh, a, a puzzle to work with. And the only way I've got flexibility is to be in tune with what I think is good for me and have the cash to be able to deploy, like mm -hmm. Jim Rickards was saying. So, I mean, in other words, you don't focus on calling tops. You, you, you not what I do. focus on what's good for you. I mean, uh, you, that, I think that's a great lesson. I mean, come on. I mean, why, why wouldn't you do that uh, at the end of the day? Well, an another thing, um, I do better in more volatile times. Really? So I, I, so I, oh, yeah. yeah. So I feel that I'm, I'm comfortable with the volatility with respect to the work that I do. I know that 11, so when, when I joined Twitter, one of the things I thought was interesting to see, because it was a much more volatile period, a higher velocity strategy for me yeah. was more advantageous. Right. The stuff moved more. Um, and I felt So you got happier, faster, take it off. Put it, it, back just, on, it, lower. It, it just put me in a position where I felt like I was comfortable playing the game that was offered to me. Yeah. I mean, I, I, it's funny you say that, because I actually do much better in higher volatility environments as well, because I feel like you can fade your range. So in other words, at the top end of the range you sell, you're going to get a chance to buy it back. It's when, so, when a range is, or when a market's one way and volatility is going to all-time lows, it's almost impossible to give this person who's asking that question the proper advice. So I know that I remember this very clearly. Uh, I believe it was October 4th, 2011. Um, they, I think the low of the S&P 500 in cash was something around 1074.77 at 10.30 in the morning. Now, you were increasingly something bullish like <laughs> at the time. What people forget was the S&Ps fell 25 points after the close the day before. Yeah. They then fell another 50 points. That, I mean, it was just this extraordinary burst of volatility. Um, and that ushered in, over the course of the next 20 trading days, a 200-point move. Now, when I used to call editorial passive trend followers, believe me, the people that were writing on the morning of October, other than you, were saying that we're going, without, we're going, we're going something lower. So the challenge for all of us is, and I'm sorry we weren't, play, we, we weren't able to play that digital rain video, because that's my life. I look at this oncoming sheeting of, of, of information every single day. Yep. How do I identify uh, an index, a, a, a sorting mechanism, a ranking mechanism, and have it be meaningful to me? It's a full-time job. So, but that's what we're all faced with. Yeah. So just because I didn't pay attention to something doesn't mean it didn't matter to me. I, I, I love how you pay attention. I love how you I pay. You, you are just one of the market's great students. And you're not afraid to say that you want to learn. You're applying everything that you can learn that can help you. And you're really focused on, on what you should be focused on, which is you. So I, congratulations on everything that you've built. Uh, for yourself. I mean, it's quite robust. I think Goldman would give a lot of money, actually, to, well, to snatch yeah. that back away from you. But uh, maybe I should say congrats for not uh, being, being in somebody else's desk anymore. I, I, get, I get asked by a lot of students, yeah. um, if there was one piece of advice, what would it be? Uh, learn as much, ma much mathematics as you can. Yeah. Um, I'm more excited about math at 54 years old um, than I ever have been in my entire life. Math gives you vision. And it's that vision and that computational output that is going to create the most uh, valuable narrative for the market going forward. Love it. I love math. I love Buddy Carter. So thank you very much.